I want to talk to you a bit about uh, the 12 steps and the model for handling addiction that I've written about myself in my book, Recovery, because I want to see what you think of it. Uh, like, so, like... Uh, the 12 steps have anonymous fellowships, which I, if I were to belong to them, I wouldn't be able to say I belong to them without breaching their code of anonymity. But uh, the, uh, what's positive about uh, this approach to addiction is, uh, as we've discussed off mic, uh, that it creates community, mm -hmm. like the other people that have got a similar endeavour. In fact, it was Jung that identified uh, the, uh, this uh, this solution. Yeah. Yeah, um, he said that like people that have got chronic addi addiction issues will struggle to change unless they have a spiritual realization of some kind yeah. and the support of a community yeah. well on the spiritual realization component that's actually supported by the relevant addiction literature one of the classic cures for addiction is spiritual transformation and the hardcore scientists have have laid that out as as a reality in the addiction literature i agree because to use more secular language around that a spiritual transformation could just be a change of perspective mm -hmm. a, a renewal yes, a radical of, change of perspective yeah, yeah. from and, and, and typically in my experience that's from a self-centered view a self-obsessive view about getting your own needs met uh, a solipsistic narcissistic perspective of life is this uh, is just an adventure where i go around trying to accumulate and accrue to oh wow i'm here to be of service Service. That's sort of the mm -hmm. transition in right, right. Yes. microscopically. But in addition to uh, community, like having connections between one another, the, the 12 steps themselves, I think, are an interesting model for transformation and shouldn't be overlooked. And in mm -hmm. fact, what my book was about is, can could that method be transposed to anybody who's interested in change? So I wanted to talk to you about that to get your perspective on sure. them. The first step is acknowledging that you are powerless over your addiction and that your life has become unmanageable. Just admitting, this is mm -hmm. I don't want so to that, be in this situation. Okay, so, okay. Okay, so two, there's two parts to that admission. Eh? One is that you're in trouble. Yeah. And I guess there's three. You're in trouble and it's serious. Things could be better mm. and you don't have the wherewithal at the moment to make them better. So the thing that's interesting about that is there's a kind of radical humiliation and humility that mm. goes along with that. So you say, I have a problem yeah. and what I know at the moment isn't sufficient to solve it. Great, yes. because now you've opened yourself up to the possibility of learning something. Because yes. you say, well, I don't know. I don't know enough to fix this. It's like, yeah. okay, well, you could learn. And one of the things that's so interesting about people is that if they decide they have a problem and they also notice that they could learn, the probability that they will learn goes way up. Mm, that's very interesting. You've actually conflated the first three steps there in your analysis of the first one because the, the first one is admission that there's a problem. The second one is recognising that things could improve, like came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And the third one is made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God as we understood God. So like, you know, yeah. Admit yeah, we could talk about that from a secular Go perspective. On. Well, we could talk about that from a secular perspective and say, well, there's a, there's a higher order moral principle that needs to be brought into the situation. And you sort of described that right at the beginning of the question because you said, well, what, partly what you do when you move from an addicted state, fr from a psychological perspective, is move from a viewpoint of the gratification of immediate desire and, and maybe the accumulation of things as a marker of mm -hmm. success to the notion that, no, you actually have a higher purpose and that higher purpose might involve being of service. That could be of service to yourself, which means you wouldn't be addicted anymore because that's not a good way of being of service to yourself, but of service to yourself and the broader community, however you might define that. That's a higher order purpose and it can integrate your motivations at, at a level that doesn't leave you at the whim of impulse. That's yes. the purpose of a higher order motivation. So, okay, so we've got three. Yes, that, that's the, the first three, is to get you to that position where you're willing to change, believe in the possibility of change, and accept help in order to achieve that change. Yep. The fourth and fifth steps are about inventorying. Get, like, so this is where uh, the 12-step program becomes a fusion of spirituality and psychoanalysis because the fourth step is uh, like a, a four-column method where you write down a list of all your resentments in your life, your mm -hmm. childhood resentments, your resentments against uh, the government, people you work with. You write it all down, and then there's a diagnostic tool where you identify what it is in you that doesn't like that mm -hmm. and 
and also interestingly in uh, in 12 step um theology let's call it it says that anything any time that you are personally disturbed there is you have to take responsibility for it to a degree there is something in you that's being affected yeah you should at least ask yourself that question yes like, is it me or is it the world yes it's like well let's consider first the possibility that it might be you i wrote about that in the sixth rule right Put your house Set in your perfect own house. order. Yes, yeah. yes. In fact, I've got our two rule. Like my, like I did a truncated and somewhat more uh, as, uh, linguistically explicit, uh, an expletive laden version <laughs> of the twelve steps. And I've got your twelve rules for life here, and they don't necessarily correlate. But like, because like you know, say your first one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Oh, that's a, a great chapter, I think. And I love the you know the lobster stuff and this sort of the uh, the ancient, timeless, almost roots. of of hierarchies yeah, yeah. and the chemicals that are at play, what's happening when you're, you know, what, what is at play when we talk about self-esteem. Um, I, like, and this, yeah, the sixth one, set your own house in perfect order. I said before you criticize the world, steps four and five in the tw in a 12 step mm -hmm. program, deal with that. Mm -hmm. Inventory, what's going on in your right, life. Right. Inventory, what are your baggage is in your own personal life. Well, narrative. you think it's very practical that it's like, well, let's say you want to fix up your house which is actually quite a lot like fixing yourself up, which is a very common dream metaphor. Yeah. Fix. Well, the first thing you want to do is go look around and see what needs to be fixed. You know, and, and this, the interesting thing about that, and this is akin to what comedians do, is that as soon as you're willing to admit, comedians look at a problem and then rise above it right away and make a joke about it, but as soon as you're willing to admit that you have a problem, then you're, you've immediately contacted the part of yourself that's at least strong enough to admit that you have a problem. And so as soon, the act of admitting the problem is actually the first step to solving it. Yes. So you might say, well, and it, it's an optimistic step because you, you might say, oh, my God, I can't admit to I, that I have a problem because what if I can't solve it? Well, exactly. So then maybe you won't admit to it. If you do admit to it, you're simultaneously admitting to the possibility that you could solve it. Yes. And then it can actually become something that's optimistic. You can yes. say, well, my life is horrible. It's like, OK, but I'm doing 50 things wrong. Well, great, I could fix those things and then maybe it wouldn't be so horrible. It demonstrates the admission itself demonstrates progression and possibility for further progression. Exactly. I think it relates That's to why the... humility is always stressed in, re in, in great religious traditions. Humility is precisely that. It's like you have to look at why you're not so good. Yeah. You have to, and, and, you know, that, that has to break down your pride to some degree and your arrogance. It's like, well, that's great because if you break down your pride and your arrogance, then you're primed to learn and you can solve your problems. So there's nothing in that. It's a bit crushing to begin with because you might think, oh, my God, there's really a lot of things wrong with me. Yes. But at least then you're on the on the road to fixing them. My personal journey of recovery has been a, like a kind of death. It, like, you know, mm -hmm. like at, when I was 27, it was like the death of the drug addict self. That guy died. That's funny because I told Tammy when we were coming here today that when you were 27, you made the decision to live. Yes. I knew it was 27 because that's when people... I'm die. going to say like you, but, you know, yeah. celebrities who, who are sort of on fire, they die all the time at 27 because they don't make that decision. They decide that they don't decide that they're going to take that final step into maturation. They want to hold on to that Peter Pan thing, that that possibility. Poor you bet. You exactly that. They want to hold on to that. And you you can't hold on to that and live. Yes. Yeah. And then there's a further death I'm noticing now in my early 40s that like, oh, now at the midway point, yeah. at the midway, in a sort of Dante-esque way, uh, I, and now I'm moving towards the grave. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, there's a different kind of alertness emerging. And back to this step okay. four and five moment, yeah. this process of inventorying. After you've made an inventory and you've, you've correctly, you've honestly and openly put down everything, incidents of child abuse, things that you've said to other people, things that your shame, once you've been willing to inscribe your shame, then you tell another person, a person that you trust in the original literature, it says, you know, it could be a cleric, a doctor yep. or whatever. Yep. Typically in uh, in 12 step structures, it's like a mentor figure. But that has the, that's the role of confession, which is obviously a huge part of psychoanalysis. The point yep. in your book, I think this pertains to is when you talk about the dragon and like the dragon. Get, you said there was that kid's book that you read where it talks about the dragon getting bigger and bigger if it's not identified. Yep. I think four and five are somewhat like that. Yeah, and, well, uh, and part of the point of that kid's book is that as soon as you turn around and look at something, it tends to shrink. And that's partly because imagine that you have a memory that you won't confront. Well, there's something in that memory that's terrifying. 
but and that means it's sort of associated with everything else that's terrifying. And so it's hor it's horrible. But then when you turn around and look at it, you think, yeah, it's horrible, but it's it's horrible in this precise and defined way. Mm. And that takes it away from all the other potential horrors of it. It starts to shrink it right away. It also makes you into the thing that can turn around and look at the horror, which is a real real positive transformational act on your part. So it's true that somehow in like that being being prescriptive and being specific, the problem becomes manageable yes, because exactly. otherwise it's limitless. That's it's exactly, potential. Exactly, yeah. It becomes uh, apocalyptic yeah. in the end. What what's the worst thing that's happened is I could be destroyed and everyone I love could be destroyed yeah. and Earth itself could be destroyed. And until you say, well, actually, no, what this is is you feel inadequate because uh, you weren't role modeled correctly. Right. <laughs> There's all oh, right. Well, I can maybe take care of that. Right. That's still bad, but it's not everything. And then you and you you. you Phrase that exactly right is that without that attentive delimiting it becomes apocalyptic that and th that's a very very old idea so ah. one of the things that happens in the mesopotamian creation myth the enuma elish is that uh, the gods are created they're they're the, they're the offspring of chaos that's a good way of thinking about it and they become very careless and they destroy their category system they destroy their father essentially and chaos comes flooding back and that's what happens to people who aren't looking at things and delimiting them properly they become ap apocalyptic and do them in. So, but, but sometimes in uh, mythology, there is the positive um, confronta confronting of the god, e.g. Prometheus. So sometimes we need to steal, oh, yeah. steal the fire. Sometimes we mm. need to challenge these orthodoxies, don't we? Yes, absolutely. I mean, part, part, of the, well, part of the death that you're describing is actually the confrontation with a form of tyrant. Like your previously addicted self was the tyrant over your emergent self. Yes. And so it's an internal tyrant, and you said it was predicated on a false value system. That's a false set of gods, essentially. And so you had to confront that. That is a kind of death. I also think that some the addiction or addictive tendencies, and I don't mean as severe as chemical dependency, or forms of addiction, addiction are a kind of self-constructed formaldehyde to preserve you in the state of trauma. That trauma is acknowledged. No means to navigate trauma are present because of the isolation because you have no mentor you have no you have no doctrine you have no community so addiction steps in this is how i will preserve this is how i will not die i will find this rep notice that it's a habit a repeated pattern to sustain you a holding pattern so that you don't die because there is no way out there's no guide there's no path you're just in the forest and there isn't a way out so i feel that addiction for personal experience and i i hope and suspect more broadly is a means for sort of stasis, for preservation after trauma. The rupture occurs, well, is not mm. addressed, and, and a means for survival emerges in the form of addiction. Addiction is not your nemesis, it is your friend, at least while you're, you know, in, whilst you're in well, it. Well, there's certainly a literature on addiction that indicates that many people use addictive substances as a form of self-medication. Mm. And they tend to find the drug that best, best medicates them, let's say. And for different people, that's different drugs. Yes, so or some even gambling. It's alcohol. Yeah, like yeah. I think. It, and now, see, one of the other things that I'm proposing in my book, is to use rather grandiose terminology, is that the uh, that the template for a recovery from obvious forms of addiction could be applicable to less evident forms of addiction, i.e., mm. just patterns and habits, and um, because. Yeah. Excuse well, me. so far, the things you've laid out would be would be in keeping with that idea. Would they? Well, you admit to the problem. Yeah. I, I really also, I think the idea of laying out your resentments is unbelievably useful because that's also a way of dealing with the malevolence within you that might interfere with your own recovery. Yes. Like if you're angry at yourself, if you're angry at your parents, if you're angry at the world, the probability that you're going to be in the mental state that's going to allow you to chart a positive course for yourself yes. is very, very low. How can you have a clear and authentic relationship with your wife if you've not correctly understood what you feel about your own mother? If you feel like that you were enmeshed or trapped in some way, how am I supposed to have? An, or if, if I've not understood that, if I've not gained a new perspective, if I've not transcended it by sharing see, with another person. You see that in, in, in the Sleeping Beauty story, in the Disney story, when the prince is encapsulated in the castle in the dungeon at the end and before he goes and rescues Sleeping Beauty he has to confront his terrible mother she turns into the dragon of chaos itself he has to use honesty and truth to confront her and until he does that he can't free the maiden from her sleep yes so that yes. that's called the that's called the freeing of the anima from the negative mother archetype in Jungian psychology it's precisely that and that 
and that negative feminine will be overlaid on your partner unless you unless you're able to clarify it and clarify your relationship with it and that could be something like overprotection or it could you know in your past or it could be neglect for that matter mm. or it could be the rejection at many at the hands of many many women before you encountered this woman yes. and that then you're going to bring that bitterness forward as a kind of projection if we are unwilling to undertake this kind of excavation, then we are doomed to continually have relationships that are cutaneous, just the, the superficial coordinates will govern our experience of relationships. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the repetition compulsion from a Freudian perspective, is that, that's, and, I mean, that isn't how Freud explained it. That's how a Jungian would explain it. But, but, but the simple explanation of it is, well, if you bring the same set of pres unexamined presuppositions to every situation, the same fate will play out. You might say, well, all those women are the same. It's like, well, actually, no. But the part of the, the part of them that you're able to make contact with acts the same every time. That's yes. a very different thing. Brilliant. And this is where six and seven, the next steps that chronologically occur. Like that six, having done this inventory, you recognise what patterns have been at play in your life, which particular in the lexicon of the recovery defects of character have governed you. Often pride, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to control other people's perspective, self-pity, self-centeredness, intolerance, impatience, greed, mm -hmm. jealousy, envy, mm -hmm. lust, sloth. Right. That's like, where you identify the seven deadly sins and how they play out in your life, essentially. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so and, and you become in the step six is about becoming willing to live differently. Like, saying, I, are you actually willing to let go of lust? Right. Are you or do you like lust when mm. it comes to it? Do you like being impatient? Does it serve you in some way to be slothful? You know, it's and it's like, highly probable that it does. Yes. You know, it's 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 easy. It's gratifying. It, it's powerful. It's pleasurable, especially in the short term. Like there's lots of there are reasons that people are tempted by by the seven deadly sins. I mean, yes, they're they are kind of glorious. Oh, they're dark glory they're, and beauty. That's right. They have a rom that's exactly right. They have, there's a dark romantic, and you really see that in the deaths of celebrities around 27, is they, they fall in love with the allure of that kind of, of that romantic death, and yeah. it does them in. Sort of the anti-libido, the dark libido, the death force. Mm -hmm. So with the once you have diagnosed which particular defects of character have been most prominent in your path and become willing to let go of them, this like it's step seven is making a concerted and real effort to live without them. And this is where it kind of becomes that's a sacrifice there. Eh? That's what are you willing to sacrifice in order to move forward? You have to yes. give up something that you love. And you may have to give up the thing you love the best. Yes. That's the fundamental sacrificial motif. Sacrifice is an unattractive idea in our self, in, in our society that's based on consuming and indulgence. And this is not something that I would lay... So this is, again, perhaps you where you and I somewhat differ, is that I would not... Uh, whilst this will not change without the individual's engagement, a kind of step one, an acknowledgement that needs to be changed, this is where I say there is a social responsibility that uh, for whatever reason, our society has become a manifestation of these darker impulses. These are the prevalent forces, at least in the kind of society I live in. I don't know what it's like to live in China or mm -hmm. Libya. I'm just saying, like, in London, like, what you're Too much with, emphasis on immediate gratification. Too much emphasis on... Because immediate gratification is a tool of consumerism. This would be my argument. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, uh, but at this point in the programme, it's where the... It, the spirituality becomes, I find, personally, undeniable. That you have to... Uh, you have to call to something else. You have to, in a sense, be, lay yourself open. The mm -hmm. idea of prayer becomes mm -hmm. quite important. Now, See, uh, so there's a, there's a Jungian idea there. So the Jungian self is the thing that guides the ego through transformations. So imagine the ego, which is what you think you are. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about the ego is that the ego can be wrong and the ego can die and be reborn. So what that indicates is that there's something underneath the ego yes, that can yes. guide that process of transformation. Yes. And partly what you're calling on when you call on this higher power is at least from a psychological perspective, it's a decision to rely on that thing that can guide you through transformations. Yes, because surely, as we said, in relation to another, we are likely relating to a set of coordinates that we impose on, in inverted mm -hmm. commas, the female. The true same would be true of the self, yeah. that we have created an impression, an egoic impression. We have constructed an artificial self, but yeah. beneath it there is a higher self or an That's ulterior right. self. Yeah. That it's, can often be... composed of, it's often composed of things that you 
refused to or would, weren't willing to develop. And so when Jung talks about, for example, the incorporation of the shadow is that mm. you've constructed an ego and there's things it can do and, and can't do that it's allowed to do and it isn't allowed to do. And then there's a shadow domain that would consist of those things that you could do but haven't. And some of that's terrible, but some of it's what you need to break free. Is there an uh, uh, infinite variety in the shadow or are there sort of templates there? Would you say that, you know, a common component of the aggression. shadow is lust, aggression? Aggression and lust are so the two because they're the most, the two that are most... Uncivilized. Yeah, they're the two that are most difficult to integrate into the ego because aggression destroys and, of course, lust subsumes the individual to... To to well to sexual to sexual desire. It's such a, a lust is a, identified as a very powerful self. It can it can subsume. So I suppose that's why a lot of theological doctrines focus on the control mm -hmm. of lust. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there is of course. Well, a, it's a disruptive force, you know, because for example, if you make a medium to long term relationship with someone and you negotiate that, that provides you with a stable structure that can operate across your entire life. It's good for you, it's good for them, it's good for your kids, mm. it's good for society. But then if you're really attracted to someone momentarily, you can be driven to act on that and, and, and every all the rest of that can burn up. It's not good. And so it's no wonder that it's viewed as a, a force of a tremendous disruption. Now, it's also a force of tremendous life, right? Because you want to be attracted to people. You want to have that 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 vital libido yes. as part of a part of what's driving you forward but hopefully it's on your side and not working against you and so you know if you're successful and you've put yourself together and you're disciplined you should still be maximally sexually attractive but it should be under your control you're not a you're not the puppet of that force anymore it's integrated into you and that's a much better way to manage it. How do you, uh, in your understanding, how is the shadow incorporated? What rituals, what ceremonies, what behaviours successfully incorporate the shadow? Say, in the, using the example of lust, what's a way back in for the sort of uh, for for lust that has been disembodied or repressed? What is a mm. safe way for it back in? Is there one? Well, I think part of it is to is to admit to your desires within your own relationship you know because you might say well i'm i'm tired of my wife it's like well yeah maybe maybe you're tired of the games that you're intelligent enough to play with your wife but she's as pluripotential as you are and so you have to admit to your desires let's say and maybe you have to make them consciously manifest within your own relationship mm. and then you know and people can do that people do that by by dressing up or by by playing sexually, I would say. Yeah, play. Because by play, exactly that. And play is a transformative element. And that yes. should be, you know, and it might be that you're uncomfortable with the idea of, of your wife as sexual plaything because you think that a woman who's married should be proper and prim and should only behave sexually in a certain way. Mm. In which case, well, that becomes sterile and dull and you're more likely to be tempted by something on the outside. For me, that's a very obvious example of how habitualized thinking is prohibitive even without reaching the extremes of self-destructive addictive tendencies, if I have a habit of regarding my wife as as object A, yeah. even if that's not objectification as we typically yeah. take it, yeah. but you know, limiting beliefs about my wife, the the tools that break down addictive uh, thought patterns could be used to create new terrains, new liberty, mm -hmm. new play. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, so once you've done up to step seven, which is essentially step seven, you're right. It's also sacrifice of the old self and handing over to the, some kind of sublime divine self. Um, the, the step eight is you make a list of people that you have harmed and mm -hmm. become willing to make amends to them. So you look back at your past and go, God, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have stolen that. I shouldn't have done that. I treated mm -hmm. that person badly. That mm -hmm. was wrong. I lied. So it's moral. Mm -hmm. It becomes quite a moral Yeah, and process. that's a real repentance, right? And atonement. Atonement is at one meant. Yes. And if you're carrying transgressions that you regard as transgressions now in your life, then... Mm -hmm. You don't want to carry those forward. You want to, you want to, you want to step forward in life without that moral burden, because you'll have contempt for yourself otherwise, and you won't take care of yourself. It also, uh, in a sense, what you were talking about about allowing lust back in, incorporating lust, uh, just then, uh, this is a, a a more a broader method for incorporating annexed aspects of the self. Mm -hmm. Like you know, how can you fully love? How can I fully love myself if I know I treated that person abominably? Well, if right. I go back and say that was wrong I did 
you wrong. I owe you an amends. You uh, you invite that part of your life in. You amend That's your right. path through life as well as teaching yourself that that is not the way we mm-hmm. proceed anymore. That's step right. eight. And, and that's a real that's that's taking out that's real action in the world. It's not a hypothetical at that point, right? Yes, it's kind of like telling people what you've written down about your uh, about your faults. Yes, yes. Because it makes it real when you when you're acting it out with someone else. It's not only a mental thing at that point. And doesn't it furthermore indicate step step eight is done separate? The step eight is right up the list of yep. people. Step nine is now go do right, it. Right. it. It makes the distinction, I think, to create a space for you where you're not where you're not continually thinking. I'm not fucking doing that. I'm mm-hmm. not going to apologise. I was abused by them. Fuck that. They did yep. as much wrong as I did. Yep. You just you which just, is not the point, right? It's not the point. No. And also, I think they might have uh, done more wrong than you did. Yes, but. You're still stuck with the fact that you did something wrong. That's and right. That's not good. And if you refuse to surmount the obstacle of like you know some arbitrary measure of who is more wrong, yeah. then you continue to cast yourself in victimhood. Yeah, that's but right. But you have no personal autonomy. That's exactly right. You can't right, yeah. choose to go through. It your doesn't life. only. It doesn't matter if you're only five percent at fault, and it also doesn't matter if the other person apologizes to you. They should. It would be better for them. It might make things way, lay out. That's not the point. And this perhaps is where what I think is significant, that now your life has become not a negotiation between you and other be- beings as they materially present themselves, but between yourself and this higher purpose mm-hmm. that has been declared right. earlier, that That's you are right. now operating on the, in inverted commas, spiritual plane. Mm-hmm. You are no longer about, if I do that, I'll mm-hmm. get that. It, it precisely doesn't matter if the other person goes, I don't care if you apologize or not. See, in off. religious language, that would be expressed as the discovery of your father in heaven instead of your earthly father because your father in heaven would be the higher spiritual authority to which you owe allegiance and and you can think about that e- either in religious terms or in non-religious terms is that what you've done is you've in in some sense is you've abstracted the the idea of a higher authority and a higher purpose and you've decided to devote yourself to that that's a religious act and that's precisely antithetical to postmodernism. it's saying that mm-hmm. the, no 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 there is an essence there is a code that's right. there is a way there is a that truth is, that's right that's 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 what is precisely antithetical yes because the postmodern claim is that there are multiple ways of looking at the world many ways of, and that's true but the antithesis of that is, yes, just because there's multiple ways of looking at the world doesn't mean there are multiple proper ways of looking at the world. Yes. In fact, there's a very narrow range of proper ways of looking at the world. My uh, f- my concern with atheism has always been its uh, sort of easy affiliation with nihilism. Mm-hmm. Or oh, why don't we just wander in the street and start fucking people then? Mm-hmm. That's, what, like, that's, like, that's where my mind immediately goes. Right, if right. there is not an order, why not just smash everything mm, to course. smithereens? And you're saying ideologically, that is what's happening. Ideologically, yes. we're deconstructing God, we're de- deconstructing morality, we're and deconstructing gender, we're deconstructing... Right. And that was the danger that both, both Nietzsche and Dostoevsky pointed to, ah. clearly. It's like you dispense with the transcendent principle and you open up the landscape for impulsive nihilism. What are they responding yeah. to? Post-Enlightenment rationalism? Is that what Dostoevsky and Nietzsche are responding to? Why are they, they were responding about that essentially to the idea of the death of God. Both mm-hmm. of them. And, and that explicitly. And is that an Enlightenment idea? Like, where is, there, where is death of God happening prior be at to the ha- It'd be at the hands of a, of a kind of arrogant and narrow rationalism and a mm. materialism. Yeah. Right. And the exposition of, or the, yeah, the, the exponentially, that has led us to where we're going now, which is a kind of, okay, we're, we're sort of digging the earth from beneath our feet and right. putting ourselves that's right. into the abyss. That's right. That, that's, that's, the, that's the hypothesis, precisely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 10, 11, the, the last three steps. Step 10 is uh, like uh, continue to make inventory. So, like, let this process continue. Like, on yeah. day, uh, for me, in psychoanalytic terms, I see a therapist, obviously. Like, uh, like, is when like uh, when there's a moment I n- I know any spike in my energy if I go oh I felt some that was interesting I felt jealous there or yeah. I felt I felt small in that yeah, moment right, exactly these are the yeah. moments I know and go oh how was I participating in that what belief of mine was being challenged mm. is that a helpful belief belief being a thought that I like having um a- 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 eleven right that's a kind of consciousness is like well I'm gonna fall apart I'm gonna make mistakes. I don't want to make mistakes. I'm going to keep an eye out for when I do make mistakes and I'm going to make them conscious. 
and then I'm going to try to work on them. Yes, bringing yeah. them into um, into consciousness. Because yeah. my fear, my number one fear on a personal level, and possibly on a social level, I don't know quite how to extrapolate or conflate those two notions, is unconsciousness. I get very mm-hmm. afraid when I'm dealing with unconscious individuals. When pe- when I'm people don't know why they're doing what they're doing. You may see this in sort of violent rage or even in less dramatic or theatrical behaviors. Yeah. I yeah, feel well, there's a the great idea that that lurks at the bottom of of the Christian mythological tradition is that a little bit of consciousness destroyed the original paradise we became conscious enough to be aware of our own mortality but the cure for that is way more consciousness not a return to unconsciousness yes there's no going back there's no no going back i sometimes think the plethora of zombie movies Mm -hmm. is you know they don't know they're already dead Mm -hmm. um like so like yeah that that danger of the zombie is the danger of the desire for unconsciousness as a as a solution to life's problems and i think that this is again something we'll be invited to uh, to participate in through consumerism that live your life continually on the frequency of unconscious energy such as desire and fear that we're not being we're not being invited to participate on the level of consciousness conscious interaction presence in the moment well you could make that case if you made the case that consumerism promotes the gratification of immediate desires above all else. I think it does. That's my. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm pushing for. Mm-hmm. Um, so with this original sin, uh, like so, a little bit of consciousness is a dangerous thing. We become aware of our vulnerability, our mortality, yeah, our right. nakedness, our yeah. corporeal nature. But the solution to this is to to become more conscious. So we have to. So uh, how do you? How was that? Th- well, is you that the whole rest some of, of the Bible. Yes, I would say so. Yes. <laughs> like when, I was wondering, where does that get resolved? Not yeah. when they get kicked out of the garden, not well, when Cain well, well, slays look, Abel. Well, part of, part of what happens in, in, the, in the redemptive story is, if you think about Christ as a symbolic figure, say a symbolic of the process of transformation that we just described, yes. is one of, the, one of the morals of the Christian passion is that you need to radically accept your limitations. And so part of this keeping your sins before your eyes, which you just described, here's all the ways that I fall short of the glory of God, let's say. Mm. You know, I make this mistake, I make this mistake, I make this mistake. That's all consciousness. And it's painful, right? Because you think, well, if you become more conscious, it's this glorious process of enlightenment. And overall it is, but the details are exactly this. The things you need to become consciousness conscious of are precisely those things that you least want to become conscious of. And that, this mm. is the motif that Jung identified in the alchemical tradition because the alchemical, moti- the alchemical motto, so to speak, was that which you most need to be found, that which you most need to find will be found where you least want to look. Yeah. Right. Yes, and everyone knows that's true. Like you tell someone that, they go, oh, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, I know that's true. So, mm. and that's also the greatest barrier to enlightenment because if enlightenment was all, you know, tulips and and sunshine then everyone would be enlightened but it's not it's this continual bringing before yourself all your proclivity for for transgression and that's that and that and obviously because how are you going to solve your problems if you're not aware of them people so, don't want it, the old discipline do they jordan well it's not surprising <laughs> you know? but the alternative is far worse that's 